Hello, and welcome to this special interview with Professor N.T. Tom Wright, my good friend, who's here at St. Mary's Seminary and University in Baltimore. And we're delighted to have him back here for at least the fourth time. So, Tom, welcome back. Good to Thank have you, you back. Thank you very much. Good to be here. I'm Michael Gorman. I teach here at St. Mary's Seminary and University in Baltimore, which is the oldest Catholic seminary in the United States and the only one in the world with an ecumenical institute of theology. Over the last 13 years, we've had Professor Wright here on a number of occasions to give lectures and to receive an honorary doctorate, so we're so glad that he could be back to discuss this brand new book with us today. In uh, many ways, this book is the culmination of years of, of writing and thinking about Paul that uh, Professor Wright has done. But like many of you, perhaps, you've read shorter works by him or perhaps heard him in public giving one of his very stimulating lectures. And, I've been privileged over the years to hear him many times and to read almost everything that he's written. And I'm glad to be able to have said already that I've read this book. <laughs> so um, as, we, as we get into the interview today, what I'd like to say to begin is that what many of you know is that he is now teaching as professor of, uh, research professor of New Testament and early Christianity in St. Andrews University in Scotland. He's been there since 2010. And of course, he's written uh, many, many books and given hundreds, if not thousands, of lectures <laughs> over the years. And uh, is a spellbinding uh, lecturer, a riveting and engaging writer, and someone who I think has really made an impact on almost every aspect of Christian faith in his years of, of work and, and ministry. So, Paul and the Faithfulness of God is volume four in Professor Wright's series, Christian Origins and the Question of God all published by Fortress Press here in the U.S. and by SPCK in, in Great Britain. Now here's part of my endorsement of this important book from the back cover. Only once in every other generation or so does a project approaching the size, scope, and significance of Paul and the faithfulness of God appear. Paul's worlds, worldview, controlling stories, and theology spring to life through Tom Wright's brilliant scholarship and spirited writing. So again, Tom, welcome and happy to discuss this book with you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, Tom, first of all, congratulations on completing this long-awaited book and this big book, very big book. Um, how long have you been working on it and uh, do you wish it had finished sooner? <laughs> In some ways, I've been working on it all my life because, well, much of my life I've been concerned with Paul and I've always had in mind that one day I really want to pull together all the very different things that I've been thinking that have been going on. Um, from another point of view, it started in Princeton when I was on sabbatical at mm. the Center of Theological Inquiry in 2009, which is four years ago. Now, I've moved house and job since then, and I've done a bunch of other things as well. But over that time, this has been the big project that I've always been coming back to and pecking away at. And it's actually taken almost <laughs> most waking hours of many waking days in the last year or two in particular. Yeah, <clears throat> sure. Well, as I said, Tom, Paul and the Faithfulness of God is a very long book, but it's divided into four main parts. Could you perhaps give us a synopsis of the work, working through each of the four parts? Yes, I, I realized early on that with all the different things I wanted to cover, there was a danger of presenting the reader with just one topic after another and lots and lots of them in a sequence, which could be huge to, to chew through. And so instead I've arranged the book in four parts, but with the first and the fourth parts as a sort of step ladder or, or, or staircase going up and then coming down again at the other end, mm -hmm. because that's Paul's historical context. And um, in my experience, comparatively few students know that stuff before they come, the, the full uh, material of what it meant for Paul to be a first century Jew, a Pharisee, and then what's Paul's philosophical context, his religious world, and then not least the political context of the Roman Empire. And there's been a lot of stuff written about those, um, but it hasn't always, I think, got it quite shaped properly. And so I wanted to do that first. So that gets you up, this, up the ladder to a sort of plateau, and then the two middle sections are Paul's worldview and Paul's theology. I'll say more about that in just a second. And then the fourth part, we come back down the ladder again. So if this is who Paul is, how then does he relate to his imperial world, his religious world, mm -hmm. his philosophical world, and then not least his Jewish world? And then of course there's an introduction and a conclusion which kind of are the footprints at either end. But in the middle, I decided on the basis of what I'd written in the previous volumes in the series, that I really wanted to look at Paul's worldview before I looked at his theology, because the question of, and you know, a worldview is the spectacles that you wear. It's not what you look at, it's what you look through. And I was asking myself, what are the symbols that Paul just assumes 
with the problem then that his hearers don't assume it. So he has to be continually saying, this is how I see the world. I want you to see it too. So I'm looking in part two at the symbols, at the characteristic praxis, not least at the stories, which he assumes, which he takes for granted, and which, again, modern readers often don't take for granted, don't even know that they're there. So that's part two, to see the worldview, and that the heart of the worldview is uh, Paul's concern for the unity and the holiness of the church. And, and often in Pauline theologies, these are away at the back somewhere. Right. You get all the other topics, but then finally you get a bit about the church and ethics and so on. And I've said, actually, no, for Paul, these are uh, really central issues for him. So if, however, the church is to be united and holy, um, how is that going to happen since it doesn't have the symbols of, of Judaism, circumcision, the food laws, the Sabbaths, mm -hmm. etc., to keep it on track? Right. And so the central thesis of the book is that for Paul, theological reflection on God, on God's people, on God's promises and purposes is the thing which holds the worldview in place. So then Paul's theology, I have I've argued, is his redefinition via Jesus the Messiah and the Spirit of the central Jewish topics of monotheism, who is God, election, who are God's people, and eschatology, what is God's future. So the theology is needed by the worldview if it's to stay in place. So Paul actually launches this project of what we now call Christian theology with this big picture of the faithfulness of God, hence the book's title. So what I'm trying to do is put Paul in his historical context and in that complex historical context to see why the theology means what it means. Could you say a little bit more about this idea of mindset? Because I don't know that people use that term every day. What do you yes. mean by that, looking through? Yes, looking, yeah. yes. It, it, it is tricky. But in every culture, there are things that we just take for granted um, and that you don't talk about every day. And you only know when you've hit. And, and the way I use worldview and mindset is that worldview is something which, which a whole society or group of people have and they share in common and they don't ever raise questions about because it's just who they are. Mm -hmm. Every family has its own micro worldview, as it were, every college, every city, every certainly every culture and, and maybe every church. But then a mindset is the individual version of that, the okay. individual variation on that. But the point is, these are the things that you take for granted and that, that you don't ask questions about. So that, for instance, Saul of Tarsus growing up took for granted that there was one God, that the Torah was the, the, the revealed will of this one God, and that God would soon um, act dramatically to rescue his people from all the wicked things that had happened to them. And Saul of Tarsus just took that for granted and was going about his work of implementing it and living it out. And it was only when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus that he realized that this was both simultaneously fulfilled and shattered. And at that point, it's like somebody who drops their spectacles and accidentally or somebody else mm. treads on them. How are you going to see even to pick them up if the things that you normally look through have been broken? And so what happens in Paul's Damascus Road experience is he learns through the gospel to see the world differently, to make different assumptions. And these turn out to be very much the same shape as the Jewish assumptions, but entirely recrafted, like somebody re-grinding your spectacles so that you now come into focus on different things. And that results in a new set of theological convictions, well, right? Yes. It, it, it results in them, and the theology is necessary to sustain them, ah, because okay. if you try to sustain the worldview of a united and holy community, but without this theological reflection, um, as many churches in the Western world today indicate, when you stop doing theology, unity and holiness are among the immediate casualties. But for Paul, theology is not simply a head trip, not just organizing a bunch of categories into a kind of convenient and, and happy pattern. It's about actual prayerful, scripture-based reflection on who God is, who God's people are, what God's purposes are, so that each generation has to do this. And this is something which dawned on me when I was writing it, that um, though Paul is a theological teacher, he is equally a teacher of the task of theology. That is to say, you know the saying, give someone a fish, you feed them for a day, teach someone to fish, you feed them for right. life. Paul does give us quite a bit of theology, 
But if you give somebody a theological answer, you'll help them in the immediate situation. If you teach someone to think theologically in this way, you will help not only them, but their communities, and hopefully those that come after, mm -hmm. to go on with that task, because right. it's never ending. So Paul launches the project of Christian theology, which we are still engaged in. Yeah. In, in the book, the central thesis, at least I think, is that Paul is reworking three central Jewish motifs mm. that you just mentioned a minute ago. Mm. Um, monotheism, election, and eschatology, as you say, in light of the crucified and risen Messiah and in light of the Spirit. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came with the, to those three topics and, and how Paul does rework them in light of Jesus and yes. the Spirit? Yes, uh, my own journey to that point was long and slow because, uh, as you know, in the discipline of Pauline studies, people have often said, well, Jesus more or less takes the place in Paul's theology that was formerly occupied by the law or something like that. And then that doesn't quite work. So people say, well, maybe it's the Spirit that takes that place. And I, I used to wrestle with these and try them out and read a passage like Romans 8 or Galatians 3 and 4 and see does it work if we say instead of law Jesus and those those rather simple things don't really work and I was pushed back and back both about the law to the larger categories of who are God's people that are that are shaped by the law and particularly to who is this God who who gave the law and I began to realize and then to try it out as a thought experiment really that it looks as though in certain passages Paul has taken some of the most dramatic monotheistic statements in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, Isaiah 45, I, I alone am God, etc. Mm -hmm. And he's actually reworked those around Jesus. Right. And he's also, and this I came to quite late in the writing of the book, he's also taken the great narrative of what God does for his people, rescuing them from Egypt, leading them to the promised land, but the one who, in Paul's theology, leads the rescued people to their inheritance is the Spirit. So you find Paul using um, language which in his Bible was about the one God, and Jesus is enfolded in it as the one through whom all this happens, and the Spirit is folded into it as the one who now leads the people like the pillar of cloud and fire in the wilderness did. So that I began then to think, wow, maybe this is going on all through, and I started to run that same model through the question of who are the people of God, and all sorts of things came up in three dimensions as I did it. And then from there, it was quite easy to do it, in a sense, with eschatology sure. as well. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those thought experiments that has been very, very exciting, because, of course, what it means, the underlying claim, is that there is a sort of proto-Trinitarian theology. People used to say, you know, Trinity is invented like several centuries later, and I want to say, well, of course, Paul doesn't use the language of Trinity, of persons and substance and natures and so on, as in the later theologians, but he's talking about the one God, and he's talking about the one God with Jesus and the Spirit somehow as part of the identity, the active, dynamic identity of this one God, and that's precisely what the later theologians were trying to express for their day with their Trinitarian doctrines. So it's fair to say then that both the church and the spirit take a greater place in this book than perhaps in some of your earlier work? Is that Yes, I think, I think that's probably right. I think the, the Paul's idea of, or belief in, in the people of God, the church as the people of God, has always been there. I mean, my doctoral dissertation was, was if I, I think it was called um, The Messiah and the People of God. And the whole point was about the Messiah in Paul representing his people so that what is true of him is true of them. So I've always had that sense of the corporate identity of the people of God. But I think I've worked it out much more fully now mm -hmm. than I ever had before. And likewise, the spirit and particularly in the chapter on justification and I know this has already surprised one or two readers that when I'm talking about election i.e. who are God's people and why are they God's people and what are they for the doctrine of justification I have seen not as belonging with the redefinition of election on the basis of the Messiah, that's the foundation, but more specifically the redefinition of election through the work of the Spirit in the Gospel. So that um, by locating justification uh, in relation to both Messiah and Spirit, I think I've enabled quite a lot of Paul's language, not least in Galatians, um, actually to do the job that Paul was trying to get it to do, whereas often by omitting the Spirit from 
discussions of justification, people, I think, have often tried to put the jigsaw together with a few too few pieces, and then you result in squashing bits of the jigsaw into a shape that Paul doesn't quite agree with. Well, as you know, I'll be very happy that uh, justification <laughs> and the spirit are brought together, so I'm, I'm happy to hear that, of course. Uh, that subject, however, of justification is one that for many uh, hearers and perhaps uh, people even today are wondering, well, what does Professor Wright say in this new book about justification that's either a development from previous things or uh, saying the same thing? And are you going to be in more trouble for your doctrine of justification uh, as we move forward? I suspect I'm already in trouble because there are some <laughs> people who will never be satisfied. And it's still obviously a very hot topic and very controversial. Um, there is a danger, though, that people discussing this subject often come with two or three key buzzwords that they have in their minds and they're waiting to hear those buzzes and if they don't hear them they, they get really worried or if they hear the wrong buzz at the wrong moment then they kind of press the panic button and I want to say please stick with the argument see how it actually works because what I've had the space to do in this book happily when SPCK and Fortress said they didn't mind if it got as long as it did is actually to spell out all the key texts missing out, I think, none um, that contribute to this, so that whereas so often with justification people run a scheme and then pull in a bit of Romans, a bit of Galatians, reference to a couple of other passages and you're done, I've actually taken you step by step through the whole argument. And I think the key thing then is in the framing, that justification falls within Paul's sense of the redefinition of the people of God through the gospel of Jesus the Messiah. Now saying it like that may sound quite uncontroversial, but actually the way that structurally that shapes it means that, that the first thing to say is what God has done in the death and resurrection of the Messiah is the foundation. And that ought at once to put any stop to any suggestion or accusation that I'm thinking that God does a bit of our justification then we do the rest later on, as it were, because it's quite clear that the Messiah himself and his death and resurrection are the foundation of the whole thing. But then how does this get applied? That's where the spirit comes in for Paul operative through the gospel so that no one can say Jesus is Lord, he says, except by the Holy Spirit. So that the result of that is that when somebody confesses is that Jesus is Lord, believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead, that's in Romans 10 as you know, um, then Paul says that's it, that's the work of the Spirit, this is the sign of the new covenant and it's this faith or faithfulness, this pistis, which mirrors then the faithfulness of the Messiah. That's why faith is the badge of membership, because it's the thing which Jesus did in going to the cross, so that the whole thing fits together very tightly without, I think, any cause for anyone from actually any theological tradition to have any real grumbles with the way the whole picture now works. We'll have to see how that plays out. We, we I'm will. I'm sure you'll be uh, the yes. first to know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I guess uh, related to this, uh, you've been talking about Christ and, and the effect of Jesus' death and resurrection on Paul's theology, but one of the interesting things about this book is your strong emphasis on Christ not being Jesus' last name, on Christos uh, yeah. being consistently translated as Messiah. Can you say something about that and why that's important yes. for you? It, it's, it's a funny thing. I remember this goes way back to my early research on Paul. I, I have vivid memories of of sometimes wrestling at length with this. And, and it started with a puzzle about how Romans 1, 3, and 4 go with Romans 1, 16, and 17. And simply as a reader of that text, uh, I found commentator after commentator saying, well, Romans 1, 3, and 4, that's uh, the Son of God who's descended from the seed of David according to the flesh and designated Son of God in power according to the resurrection of the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. People have said, well, that's, that's a confession of faith, which Paul quotes up front just as a sort of flag to wave. Um, hey, guys, I'm on track with that stuff. And then he ignores it because then the theme of the letter, people have said, is 1, 16 and 17. Right. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe because the righteous shall live by faith or however you're going to translate that. And, and I, looking at that, I've said to myself from way back, actually, no, it's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation, but the gospel isn't, here's how you get saved. The gospel is 
the announcement of Jesus. And so the priority of the announcement of Jesus over the what does this mean for me thing or the fact that God's righteousness is revealed in that gospel has remained important for me because, of course, in Romans 1, 3, and 4, the flesh-spirit contrast, Jesus as descended from David and now is raised from the dead, all that, I think, comes up again in Romans 5 to 8 and then in Romans 15 when he sums up the argument of the entire letter. And the more I reflected on this, and this is going way back, but I've now actually spelt it out more fully than I've ever done before, the more I came to the conclusion that the great Western tradition, which has said, no, Christos is a proper name for Paul, has simply missed the point, and that missing that point means that the entire, again, jigsaw of how the rest of Paul fits together doesn't work because that is a crucial bit in the middle. And of course it's very odd because we think that Paul was written quite early, Paul's letters in the 50s, and that the Gospels were written later, but the Gospels are all emphatic that Jesus is Israel's Messiah. And at the end of the century there are those blood relatives of Jesus, probably nephews, who are hauled up before the Emperor Domitian on the charge of being part of a royal family. So the idea of Jesus as Israel's Messiah certainly didn't die out It'd be very odd if this deeply Jewish person we call Paul, who uses the word Christos more than anyone else does, actually didn't know what it meant and wasn't making that load-bearing in his theology. So for me, that is a vital element, but it's just normally missed entirely. One other thing on that. I think one of the reasons why that's been missed is that a lot of people have said, well, Paul is teaching spirituality and salvation. That's got nothing to do with politics. Messiah is a Jewish political title. Therefore, of course, of course Paul pushes that to one side. And I want to say, actually, we are rediscovering today the multiple political significance of Paul's gospel. And I think he's saying... Israel's Messiah is the world's true Lord. Psalm 72, Psalm 2, which is very important for him, um, Psalm 8, Psalm 110, all these are important. These are the Messiahship of Jesus confronting the Lordship of Caesar. Well, that's a great segue into my next question, <laughs> which is, once again, you have um, brought up a, a controversial subject, which is the relationship between Paul and empire, which mm -hmm. you've written on before. Is there something else you'd like to say about that, about what's new in this book or how you've nuanced maybe what you've done in the past? Yes, I think um, in the past, and this is a topic which um, has only really come up in contemporary scholarship in the last 20 years or so, right. and, and as with any new topic, like a child with a new toy, we all kind of, or many of us, grabbed it and were really very excited and no doubt overstated it. And I'm quite happy to say that I probably have overstated it or oversimplified it in some of the essays I've written in the past, um, which were exploratory. That's how scholarship works. You try a bit out, you go this way, it doesn't quite work, let's come back to it again. Mm. So I've come back, kind of regrouped, taken another run at it in this book, and I've done two things. First, I've set out much more fully than I have ever before, and I think that any New Testament scholar ever has before, how the imperial ideology of Paul's world actually worked, going round city by city and seeing how the imperial cults were located and what they meant in Galatia, in Thessalonica, etc., etc. So that then in chapter 12 of the book, when I come back after the theology and say, where does Paul belong in this world? I'm able, I hope, in a much more nuanced fashion, not just to say, well, therefore Paul says, um, too bad for Caesar, as it were, because it's not quite that easy. And one of the things I've realized in all the debates is that just as we've had to learn that the 16th century ways of asking the question are not the best ways of getting at what Paul meant by salvation, so the 18th to century to the present Western ways of asking about politics with our left-right spectrums simply isn't the best way of getting at first century Jewish views of power and empire and so on, let alone Paul's. Mm. And so I've tried um, to, to, to be explicit about moving away from our easy antitheses. Oh, Paul is against empire, therefore he's a good left-winger just like us or whatever. No, that just doesn't work any more than the old perspective on justification works for the same reason. It's anachronistic. Mm. Rather, we have to think into first century visions of power, first century Jewish visions of power, and then see how Paul deconstructs those around the gospel of Jesus and then reconstructs an idea of Jesus as the world's true Lord with a total new definition of power at the center of that. Mm. 
you know, in many ways, what you've just said reminds me of some of the controversies you had with various scholars over the years, whether it be John Barclay and on this particular topic or with John Piper on justification and so forth. One of the things I noticed about this book, and I think it was deliberate, I think you've said it's deliberate, is the idea that you want to overcome scholarly dichotomies. Yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that. What are you trying to bring together here that maybe other people would say have to be antithetical yes. or contrary? Yes, uh, this is something that students particularly find very difficult to get hold of because there are several different controversies that have gone on about Paul, and they're not variations on the same controversy. So the so-called new perspective versus old perspective, which is about justification and salvation and the place of the law and was Judaism a religion of works or a religion of grace and all that, that goes on one line, as it were. And then there's a different one, which is very big at the moment, about apocalyptic and salvation history or covenant, uh, where you've got people saying, on the one hand, uh, Paul is simply seeing the history of Israel leading up to this great climax and other people saying no Paul sees the Christ event as smashing history into little bits and creating something totally different in its place. Mm -hmm. That's not the same as the argument about old and new perspectives right. and they kind of jangle against one another and then at the same time you have people re-inhabiting Albert Schweitzer's position which is um, neither of those questions as it were. Is Paul's thought really juristic about justification at all or is is it really participationist about being in Christ? And recently we've had Douglas Campbell's enormous book basically saying it's about being in Christ and from a particular angle and the juristic stuff has to be played right down. And then in your own work, of course, the question of how does transformation, how does theosis or Christosis being conformed to the image of God, how does that sit with all these? And it's only when we map all of these out and see that they're different kinds of questions can we then start to affect what I think we have to do, which is a reconciliation. Take the apocalyptic one. One of my graduate students said not long ago, and I think it's exactly right, that for Paul, God has acted shockingly, strikingly, dramatically, unexpectedly, as he always said he would. Mm. And, and that gets the sense of sudden in breaking, but then the sense of retrospective realization, this was what the promises to Abraham always envisaged. This is what Isaiah, Isaiah always envisaged. And we, we just hadn't seen it before. So the but, unexpected fulfillment of promise is what you're ex saying. Exactly. Is what exactly, brings those two together. Exactly. Yeah. And likewise with old and new perspective. Part of the problem there is that Ed Sanders' work um, was explicitly a comparison of patterns of religion. And the religious question is important, but it doesn't catch all the theology and all the other things that are going on. And when we put it in a larger framework, so there and all these things, I hope this book is about reconciliation mm. because, and that was just kind of a nice thing to work on because I, I one of the central arguments of the book is that Paul's theology is all about reconciliation. The, the chapter, um, the book begins, begins with, with uh, the 70 and the pages on Philemon and <laughs> exactly, reconciliation, exactly. which I think will surprise a lot of people, it, it, but very rewarding will. reading. <laughs> good, good. I enjoyed writing that. Well, I have, I think, maybe one last question for you. and, and um, I guess I'd like to know personally, and maybe others would as well, from your point of view, what are some of the major contributions of your book to, for us who understand Paul, not simply as a first century Jewish Christian, mm. but as uh, the voice of God speaking to us as, as scripture, in other mm. words. Um, what is it about Paul that we as Christians need to pay specific and special attention to today? Yeah, I suppose um, uh, preachers tend to go for three points. Let me just, just uh, quickly <laughs> okay. make, make three. I think the first thing is this great emphasis on the fact that something has happened in history, the history of Jesus, his death and resurrection, which has generated a new world, which is the world that God, the Creator, always promised, but that this new world has begun, has been launched, mm. and we are now walking around in it trying to find our way and see what that might mean for us. So for Paul, it's always about the unique event, the once-off, the FAPAX, once and only once, uh, the death of Jesus only happens once, and now as a result, there is a new world and we're invited to share in it. That, that's, that's perhaps the, 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 the first thing. The second thing, I think, going back, is this business of the unity and holiness of the church. Somebody asked me the other day, if Paul could come back today, what would he say looking around? And I said emphatically, the, the first and most important thing he would be horrified by is not just that Christians in the 21st century are disunited, but that we don't care. 
Mm. It's not it's not a bother to us. We we do our own thing and we wave at each other from a distance. And he would say, how can you do that? Romans 14 is all about um, getting together across differences so that, Romans 15, you may with one heart and voice glorify God. Well, that stirs my ecumenical heart, I have to well, say. Well, of course, good, <laughs> good, good. Um, now I've forgotten what the third thing was. Um, oh, oh, yes, the, the, the third thing is, uh, is the task of theology. Going back to something I said before, Paul doesn't just give people dogmas. Here are five things you must believe. He says, this is how prayerfully, because the heart of his theology, I think, is his reworking of Israel's prayer life, the Shema and other Jewish prayers uh, around Jesus. So theology and prayer are not two different things for him. They're actually very, very closely tied together. So he's bequeathing to us a task of the prayerful, scripture-soaked reflection on who God is. And that's why, of course, the whole series is about Christian origins and the question of God, right. and now Paul and the faithfulness of God. And Paul faced this huge challenge. How can God be faithful if there was a crucified Messiah? Doesn't that destroy the whole thing? And it seems to me that every generation is faced with questions either personally or politically or practically about is there a God, does he care, is he faithful? And Paul's gospel says, work at theology this way and you will find yourself not only celebrating the faithfulness of God, but also by that means reinforcing your desire for the unity and holiness of the church. Excellent. Do you have anything you'd like to add for our uh, viewers today to what <laughs> well, we've already talked about? I, I think one of the things which really strikes me, I mean, I, I cut my intellectual teeth on Plato and Aristotle and people like that when I was reading philosophy as an undergraduate. And the more I have studied Paul, the more I want to say he's up there intellectually with those guys. I mean, his writings are much shorter, tiny, compared with Plato and Aristotle. But in terms of the themes he's dealing with, the density with which he deals with them, the passion he brings to them, and the sense of this big picture with all these little interesting details in it, um, intellectually, it's a feast. Sometimes, particularly sadly in the church, people who find Paul difficult say, oh, well, Paul was a bit cranky and he just had some odd ideas, so we'll just take the one or two bits we like. And I want to say, no, reading Paul is an exercise in growing up personally, intellectually, mm. prayerfully, in every other way. And it's, it's a task I would commend to anyone, even though it is, of course, rightly demanding. Well, on this note, we'll have to uh, draw this conversation to a close. Thank you, Tom, once again for this important book, for being here with us today for this conversation, and for your devotion to uh, prayer and study and the way that that has impacted your study of Paul and impacted the church. Now a word to my colleagues in the field of biblical studies and theology. Please consider using this 30-minute video in your classrooms with your students. It's an excellent way to introduce them to Tom Wright and to his new book, Paul and the Faithfulness of God. And in that light, Fortress Press has prepared for you a two-page discussion guide for the interview that's available on the Fortress Press website. And we want to thank uh, you once again for your time with us today. Thank you. Very good to be with you.